Well, good morning and thank you for joining with us this morning for our Lebanon Rock Church online worship service for Sunday, August the 16th, 2020. We thank the Lord that you've taken the time to join with us from wherever you are joining us from. We're grateful to have you with us here online as we worship together and lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and invite his presence in at this time, and then we'll enjoy a song of worship and praise together. So join with me as we open our service this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather together in this online worship service. We thank you for those that have joined with us, that have tuned in from wherever they are gathering with us from. Father, we pray that you'll bless this time of worship, bless this time of ministering the word. And Father, we pray that you'll help us, Lord, to uh, not only be blessed in our spirits, but Lord, encouraged today. May our faith be increased. Lord, as we begin to start a new week, as we anticipate a week ahead, we just pray that you'll bless us now, Lord, and anoint the preaching and teaching and ministry of the Word of God and everything that is said and done. We ask your blessings now upon all of us. For it is in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen. This time we're going to enjoy a song of worship together. So enter into worship with us and then following our time of worship, I'll be coming back with this morning's message. be 
Praise the Lord and God be praised. If you have your Bibles, your tablets, your smartphones, whatever your Bible application is this morning, turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Gospel of John, chapter 20, and we're going to start reading at verse number 19, reading all the way down to verse number 22. We are continuing our current ministry sermon series on uh, the red letters, the teachings, and words of Jesus Christ with message number eight this morning which is Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. So John chapter 20, verses 19 to 22, and we're gonna discuss a topic that you don't hear mentioned very much in many pulpits, but if you're a full gospel Pentecostal church like Lebanon Rock Church is, or you are uh, familiar with uh, full gospel Pentecostal charismatic uh, worship and, and services, this is a topic you'll hear preached in some churches, but not all. But it is important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is just as real today as it was 2,000 years ago whenever it was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And the Lord intended for the Holy Spirit to be a vital part of not only the Christian believer's life, but a vital part of the ministry and work and mission of the church. And we're going to look here in John chapter 20. We're going to read verses 19 through 22. And this is the story of Jesus appearing unto his disciples. He's already risen from the grave. He's already appeared unto his disciples on a couple of other occasions. He's appeared to the women at the tomb, and he's also appeared to some disciples. But now we see here where Jesus is about to appear now uh, before his entire group of disciples that are hiding for fear of being found out by not only the Jewish religious leaders, but also the Romans as well. So John chapter 20, verses 19 to 22. And again, we're continuing our sermon series of messages on the red letters, the words and teachings of Jesus. And this is message number eight, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. John chapter 20, let's begin reading at verse number 19. I'll be coming out of the New King James, but whatever version of Bible you have is going to work and is going to be uh, certainly uh, acceptable for this morning's message. John 20, starting at verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'll bless this message and this word that we're about to hear this morning. Give it free course in our hearts and our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now our story begins with Jesus appearing in the, uh, in the uh, room where the disciples were hiding, the doors were locked, and they were fearful of what might befall them after Jesus had been crucified and now by this time, Jesus has been crucified, nailed to the cross. He's risen from the grave. He has shown himself unto his disciples. Again, this is the first day of the week. It's in the evening of the day where Christ had risen from the grave. So we already see where Jesus had appeared unto Mary, had appeared unto uh, the, the women that were his disciples, and he had already uh, come out of the tomb. He's alive. He's risen from the grave, and now he appears to all of his disciples that are gathered in this hidden room here that are hiding. And if you notice there, he showed them his hands and his side. So he was validating and proving to them that he was the Lord Jesus Christ and that he had indeed risen from the grave. Now, after he had appeared and the disciples had recognized that he was not only the Lord Jesus Christ, but he had risen from the grave. Jesus did something wonderful. He breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is significant because if you look at that story, Jesus had risen from the grave. He had already paid the price and purchased the debt of sin that was owed by mankind. 
when Jesus cried out, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, or he died, as the Bible says, he had completed God's plan of redemption, so the forgiveness of sins had already been taken care of. The debt of sin had been paid. Now that Jesus had risen from the grave, he had conquered uh, death and hell and the grave. He had paid the price for sin. He breathed on his disciples. And that was a sense of him breathing new life into the disciples. A regenerating work was being done when he breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Later on, as we're going to look at in this message this morning, the disciples realized the power of that spirit. But in this particular passage of scripture, Jesus is telling them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, as a pastor, I can tell you perhaps one of the most important yet least understood truths of the Bible is the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've come to realize this as an unchanging truth and know this to be true. I have experienced it myself, but the Lord has led me into a deeper knowledge and experience, and my understanding of this truth has not only become more enriched, but has become more real. You know, I, I read again in the scriptures here in John 20 and 22, which reads, And when he, that being Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to focus on that phrase, he breathed on them. Jesus breathed on the disciples. He exhaled and he breathed upon them. He, he sent forth breath in their direction on and over them. There's a meaning behind the story, behind this story of Jesus breathing on the disciples. This kind of parabolic deed an earthly action intended to convey a larger, more heavenly, more deeper spiritual message. He wasn't just breathing. He was breathing on them to create an effect. Both what Jesus did and what he said and what he did here and what he was performing when breathing on his disciples was equivalent to the act of breathing on the disciples the breath of God, the creative breath, the life-giving breath, the spirit-empowering breath of God. This is the same word breathe that we read about in Genesis 2 and 7 when it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul or a living being. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word ruach could be translated spirit or breath or wind, depending on the context. The same is true in the New Testament Greek word for pneuma. That means breath, spirit, life. And so this is at the conclusion of Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, after the resurrection and before his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Here he breathes on his disciples and, and reveals his identity as divine, as the Son of God, as the Christ. The disciples already knew that Jesus was the Christ and the Son of God, but he certainly confirmed it yet again one final time that he was indeed the Son of God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And that was a foreshadowing of the Spirit of God that would be poured out upon them at Pentecost. And so, you know, we, we see this and read about this, and we see where Jesus breathed on his disciples. And that was the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, much like the regenerating work of the Spirit that happens to us when we uh, allow Christ into our hearts and into our lives as Lord and Savior, we are born again, we are transformed, we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. But, but the power of that Spirit is never realized until we receive the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They are two very distinct experiences, which you probably won't hear preached in a lot of churches, but it's still very much true today. You know, when I was first saved and came to the Lord 30 years ago, I was, uh, I was taught that I was filled at the moment of salvation, that I was filled with the Spirit of God. I was regenerated and born again and transformed. My heart, my mind, my soul, my life had been changed. And so I understood that I had become a new creation, a new creature. But I did not realize that Jesus had also given the disciples the Holy Spirit, and then promised 
that that same spirit would later baptize them, which we're going to talk about as we unpack this message this morning. It is important to remember that the Holy Spirit is a vital part of the life of the body of Christ in the church. The late, great uh, Pastor Burt Clinton, and one of the greatest men of God I ever heard, often would say everything that the body of Christ, the New Testament church, will ever need to do its work and ministry and mission on this earth is found in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And that is so true. We need the moving of the Holy Spirit now more than ever. There are a lot of spiritually dead churches out there. There are some churches that have no life, no love, no joy, no power. We are witnessing the advent now of a corporate church that likes to entertain, that likes to make people feel good, that likes to tell people what they need to want to hear, not what they need to hear. But what Jesus Christ was calling the early church to do was to be full of power, to be full of truth, to be full of love. And that's what we have to get back to. It's one thing to lead a person to the Lord Jesus Christ and, 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 and lead them to the experience of salvation. I thank God that 30 years ago I received salvation. But I'm also thankful that a few months later I received the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that changed my life completely. So we're going to look at three points this morning as we unpack this message. And I hope that, that you'll stay with me and that this will encourage you. And if you've never experienced this great, wonderful experience of the filling of the Holy Spirit, I hope that this will put within you a desire and a hunger to seek and to desire that for more of that in your life. So our first point this morning that we want to really get into our spirits is this. We are saved, born again, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Again, let me say that again. We're saved, born again, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Now, we, we want to go back to John chapter 3 and look at verses 3 through 7 when Jesus explained the salvation experience to Nicodemus. In John 3, starting at verse number 3, Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now God puts his spirit within us and we are born again as a child of God. This is the beginning and not the end. The Bible states that when we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment we surrender our hearts to Christ, that spirit is what comes in and changes us. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 9 says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, the apostle Paul writes, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul asks a question, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? whom you have from God. For you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's without question that in John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, the disciples clearly received the Holy Spirit. And as I said a moment ago, this was representative of the regenerating work that the Holy Spirit was doing in their lives. 
You see that because they had all departed and fled from Jesus. Uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Uh, Judas, unfortunately, had uh, betrayed Jesus, later would take his own life by hanging himself on a tree. We see where the disciples had all failed, but when Jesus had completed God's plan and work of redemption on the cross, when he breathed on his disciples, that was representative of the Holy Spirit regenerating them and changing them and transforming them. The real power of the Holy Spirit was to come later at Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, when the power of the Holy Spirit would, would not only infill and baptize these disciples, but they went from these timid, fearful, meek, uh, ignorant, unlearned men into men that God could use to bring the gospel message forth with power and authority. And Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5 that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we see that the, 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 the Holy Spirit is what, is what fills us at salvation. It regenerates. It changes us. Uh, it turns our life completely around. We're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are cleansed and forgiven. The Holy Spirit comes into our life. It changes our heart, our mind, transforms our entire being, and we are regenerated, born again, if you will. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, except we're born of, the, of water and of the Spirit, we cannot see the kingdom of God. Speaking there that it's one thing to be born in an earthly birth. It's something entirely different to be born by the Spirit. That's why it is so important. He breathed on his disciples. Again, that, that word, that, that Hebrew word, ruach, which means breath, life, uh, uh, you know, that, that went forth and, and that brought life to the disciples. That's why the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. What is it that makes us new? It's the Holy Spirit. When I came to the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved, I gave my heart to the Lord. I looked the same. I still was still a 19-year-old young man. I was still a sophomore in college. I, I wore the same clothes. I, I still had the same physical features. But on the inside, something had happened. The Holy Spirit works from the inside out. That's where the change truly takes place. So that's our first point this morning is to focus on the fact that we are saved, born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And secondly, number two, our second point is this. The disciples later received the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now, they were, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were regenerated by the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. But later on, about 40 days later, uh, after Jesus had ascended back uh, to the uh, right hand of the Father, uh, then 10 days following that, some 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is when they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples believed in Jesus. They received the gift of salvation. They were regenerated by the Spirit of God when he breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were sealed by that Spirit, as we are sealed by that Spirit when we come to salvation. But they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and came to Christ about 50 days later when they were praying in the upper room. Fearful men that were hiding from persecution and were fearful of what would happen to them later would come out of the upper room and they would proclaim and preach the gospel. Now Jesus showed himself for 40 days on the earth after he had risen from the grave and he did many miracles, many signs. In fact, one of the gospels say that if they were to write down and record all the things that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books to contain all the works. Jesus revealed himself to be not only the Messiah, not only the Son of God, not only the Savior of the world, but he was a risen Savior. And, of course, the disciples then followed and were with Jesus for those 40 days. And then he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. Outside a hillside in Bethany, he told the disciples to go back to Jerusalem, to tarry, to wait for the promise of the Father, as Luke 24 and 49 said. Uh, he told them, he said, wait for the promise of the Father, which as I've said to you, uh, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we read here 
In Acts chapter 1, verses 48, Jesus is speaking his final words to his disciples. He's about to ascend back up and be received into heaven by the Father. It's been 40 days uh, since Jesus has shown himself unto his disciples and since he's risen from the tomb. And here's what he says, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, it says, And being assembled together with them, that's Jesus and his disciples, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, later... We read in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the disciples went back to Jerusalem, went into the upper room, they tarried, they prayed, they fasted, they waited for 10 days. And then 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, we pick it up in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared unto them cloven or divided tongues of fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Sadly, because many people do not understand this glorious story of truth, there is a difference between these two events. They do not seek the greater power of God that can completely transform their lives, transform their families, transform their service and ministry uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Every person who truly repents and invites Jesus Christ uh, as their Lord and Savior is 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 baptized or is, is one that receives the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And and first John chapter three calls this God's seed. I read it a moment ago in 1 John 3 and 9. And, and teaches that this is when we are born of God, his seed remains in us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit that we just read about here in Acts chapter 2 is a completely different uh, event and experience. When I came to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, August the 28th, uh, 1990, it's been 30 years ago almost, uh, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Not only was I washed in his blood, but I received the Holy Spirit. He transformed and regenerated my heart. There was a new birth, a new experience of salvation. I was changed from a sinful 19-year-old young man to a born-again believer, a child of God. Christ came into my heart. I experienced what Jesus talked about in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. But on November the 4th, a few months later, I received the baptism of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, much like we read about here uh, in the book of Acts. The disciples uh, had, had heard Jesus speak to them, peace be with you, peace be unto you. He breathed on them in that, in that room together and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, 50 days later, they experienced the power of that Spirit. And that is where it is so important that we understand this is still a vital, very important part of not only the church of the 21st century, but it was a vital part of the first century church and needs to be duplicated and practiced in the 21st century church. Now, a lot of people say that's not for today, Pastor Scouts, that's not for the church of today. And I would, I would strongly beg to differ. I, and there's some scriptures that we'll look at later that will help us identify where that truth is still very much real for us today. Now, I know this much, that the early church was, was not only saved and, and, and not only uh, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
And the early church came out of the upper room and they exercised great power. We see where, where the apostle Peter took a man who was slain by the gate called Beautiful uh, in the third chapter of Acts. And he picked him up and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately the man was healed. We read in Acts chapter 9 where Saul of Tarsus, who, was a, uh, who would later become the Apostle Paul, persecuted the church and was seeking to, to find uh, uh, Christians and arrest them and, and put them in jail, or much worse than that, even possibly harm them or kill them. And he, he, and he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and Saul of Tarsus was led by the hand because he was blinded uh, to the house of Judas, a man of of, of Damascus and a man named Ananias came and laid his hands on Saul. He received his sight again and it was restored and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit and would become the Apostle Paul. The early church experienced this time and time again. In fact, we read in the book of Acts where they not only were filled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, but they were later refilled. There was boldness and power. You don't see that in the church today. We have a church today that is more content on entertaining and making people feel good. And as I say many times, we often preach a gospel that people want to hear, not what they need to hear. The early church had power. In fact, the Bible said great fear came upon people. No one would even dare to join this group because of the power that they demonstrated. Now, you know, I've studied all my life. And uh, as, a, as a young man, I'd studied science in high school and in college. And I was fascinated with, with earth science, especially. And when I was in college, also in high school, I had studied about earthquakes, plate tectonics, and had studied about all different types of uh, um, earthquakes and fault lines. I knew what a, a mid-continental fault line was. I knew where the San Andreas Fault was. I knew where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was. Uh, I loved to study that and uh, was always fascinated. Um, with, uh, with plate tectonics and with, with geological studies. And I had known just about everything you needed to know about an earthquake. But in 1992, I moved to the state of California and uh, was pursuing a ministry, was gonna be working in ministry and, and uh, had made a move out there. And my very first night that I stayed out in the state of California, early that next morning, the Yucca Valley quake of 1992 hit the state of California and I was awakened out of a dead sleep by an earthquake that was 7.2 on the Richter scale. It was the scariest, most dangerous thing I had ever lived through. I had heard about the power of earthquakes. I had heard about the uh, intensity of, of, of seismic waves and seismology. I had understood that earthquakes generate a lot of energy and, and, and seismic waves and power. But until I experienced it, I didn't truly understand it. Now I know when I say an earthquake is dangerous, I know what I'm talking about because I've lived through four of them when I lived out in California. And many of them were very, very, uh, very dangerous, very destructive, very large scale earthquakes. Well, the Holy Spirit is a lot like an earthquake. You can read about it and you can uh, have a great understanding. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit at salvation. We can receive the new birth and salvation. But until we receive the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we really truly don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. I understood what that power was about when I received it on November the 4th, 1990. And many times in the last 30 years, I've been filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that wonderful, wonderful experience. So each time that we read in the Bible, of the Holy Spirit being poured out or baptized into the lives of believers, the immediate response is to go out and to go forth. And so the, the, the church today needs that because there's a lack of power in the church. And I submit to you that God's power has not diminished. The church's, the church's desire, the church's uh, 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 hunger for that is not there. And so the reason why we're not seeing more miracles, we're not seeing more supernatural occurrences is because the Holy Spirit is not moving in the church, not moving in our lives, and we are not hungering for more of that. You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The church of the 21st century, we need to be searching 
for, the, for, for God. We need to be desiring for God to move in our midst. We need to be praying each day, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Let me feel that power. Baptize me afresh in the Holy Spirit, Lord, that I can know more of that power and more of the power that you have. You know, I often think about a situation that occurred in my life when I was about 10 years ago. I was out of my garage working on a project, and I'm no, no handyman for sure, but I was working on a project, and I had a drill, a power drill, and I was drilling holes into a project I was working on for my son, Bryce, who was about eight years old at the time. And I remember that all of a sudden, that drill just stopped. And, uh, and so in a bit of frustration, I dropped it down, and I went into get a glass of water, came back out. I was huffing and puffing, very upset. My wife came out to the garage and said, what's the matter? I said, oh, this drill. I said, I've had this drill a couple of years and now this stupid thing doesn't work. And my wife said, have you tried checking to see if it's plugged in? Sure enough, it was out of the cord. I plugged it back in and the power came back on. You know, you can have all the power tools in the world. You can have all the electrical equipment in the world, but until you plug that in, to the source that provides the power, it'll never function the way it should. The church can have all the ability, all the talent, all the giftings, all the, all the conveniences and everything that we have today. But if we don't have a source of power, we're not tapped into that source of power, which is the Holy Spirit, we're really not gonna function the way we should. So understand that the disciples received that promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit after they had received uh, the regenerating work of the Spirit the day Jesus had risen from the grave. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And our third and final point this morning is this, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, we must hunger and thirst for it. Now again, every person that comes to Jesus Christ and is born again, they are filled with the Spirit of God. It regenerates us from the inside out. But to desire the power and the, and the true, true anointing and power of that spirit, we have to hunger and thirst for it. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. A believer who is serious and truly hungry and thirsting for God will never be satisfied until they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us that if we desired and thirst for more of the power of the Holy Spirit, we would receive it by seeking after the Lord Jesus Christ, because he'll give us that spirit. In John chapter 7, in verse 37, 38, and 39, at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus, it says in verse 37, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was speaking here saying, if you're thirsty, if you are desiring something, I will give it to you. He rose from the grave on the third day. That first day of the week, he appeared to Mary and the other women at the tomb. He later appeared to all of his disciples, but he appeared to his disciples there in the, in the locked room. In John chapter 20, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And they did. And they were regenerated and filled with the Holy Spirit. The regenerating work of the new birth took place in those disciples. And later on in the day of Pentecost, they received the power and baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's important for us as New Testament Christians to understand that this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not just for one generation or group of believers. It wasn't just for the book of, of Acts. It just wasn't for the early church. Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. And he gave this great command and promise to those who were assembled. In Acts chapter 2, verses 38, 39, and 40, after Peter had preached and had spoken about what they had seen, the men and those that were gathered said, what does this mean? And Peter, of course, if you read in Acts chapter 2, after the outpouring and baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
came into the upper room in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. We read where the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. The, the tongues of fire sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what happened was is that Peter then stood up and began to preach as he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they heard this, he said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Where God said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And of course, as he continued to preach, many of them said, said, what must we do? They were saying, what do we have to do to receive this? So in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 39, and 40, Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter was saying that what they had witnessed, the baptism and then filling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, did not stop with that initial outpouring, but continues on. And it was not only for those at Jerusalem, but for the entirety of the world. And as many as would call upon the name of the Lord, anyone, the Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is a free gift for everyone. Well, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a free gift for all as well. Our wonderful assistant pastor, the wonderful teacher and preacher of the gospel, Pastor Paul Fields, often says in his Bible studies and in his teachings, that when a person accepts Jesus Christ at salvation, they become an immediate candidate for baptism in water, which is a public profession of their faith and their uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ in salvation. And he later said, but they also are an immediate candidate for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This wonderful experience that we're sharing this morning is not just for one group of people not just for one individual group of people in the Bible that we read about. Peter said it was for as many, as many as our Lord God would call. God called me to salvation. God has called you to salvation. You have called upon the name of the Lord. I have called upon the name of the Lord. We've received salvation. That gift is just as real today as it has ever been. So as we close this morning, I encourage you this week, to pray this week and seek and ask God to fill you afresh with the Holy Spirit. If you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you've never truly ever experienced that, I encourage you to pray and ask God to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to give you a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying that you don't have the Holy Spirit. What you are praying is for God to give you all the power and blessing of the gift the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to do that. It will change your life and it will, it will certainly, certainly transform your Christian experience. Someone asked me, Pastor Matt, do I need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be saved? No. Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit greater than salvation? No. Nothing is greater than the salvation of your soul. The baptism of the Holy Spirit makes your salvation so much greater, so much richer, so much sweeter. So as we close this morning, I encourage you this week to seek for that, to pray and ask God to do that. We also pray that God will bless you this week, that God will be with you this week as you go into this next week of your life. We pray for our young people going back to school. We pray for our young people going back to the college campuses. And we pray for our nation and for our country. This is a very critical and pivotal time election year, many things going on. So join with me in prayer as we bring our service to a close with the benediction prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and worship you this morning in this online worship service. Lord, we have touched on a subject and shared a message today about a topic that's rarely preached in the pulpits of the church in America today. Lord, I pray that if there's one that's listening this morning that's never experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, has never truly received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that they will experience that. Lord, I pray that you will bless them today, that you will minister unto them today. 
Lord, as we go into this next week, God, of our life, we pray for our young people going back to school, our young people on the college campuses. We just cover them in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We pray for your divine protection to be upon them and be with them as they are at school. Father, we pray for our nation, Lord, in this very critical time. We pray for our upcoming elections, Lord, that your will would be done. We pray, Lord, for all the struggles that are going on in our country today, the cultural and civil unrest and the uh, distractions, God, and just all of the uh, things that are taking place in our nation, Lord. We pray for revival and spiritual renewal to come. We pray for those that are sick and those that are afflicted, those that are in the hospital, those that are grieving the loss of a loved one right now, those, Lord, that have financial needs, Lord, those that are just in the midst of a valley or going through a trial. We pray for strength and encouragement. Lord, we pray this week that you'll uh, give us a fresh, fresh touch of your spirit. Lord, I pray, God, not just myself, but every believer, Lord, those that I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and those that have not yet, God, baptize us afresh, refill us afresh, and let us walk in power and faith. And Lord, we pray that you'll bring us back at the appointed time next week. Dismiss us from this place, but not from your presence. For it is in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen. God bless you again, and thank you for being with us. We hope that this service was a blessing to you. We will see you all next Sunday morning as we gather together again for another online worship service. God bless you, and have a great day.